The racing genre as of current year doesn't have anywhere near the same presence as it had even a decade ago, and the games that come out have been mostly met with a middling reception at best. Some games are shadows of their former selves, others are completely tone deaf as to what fans of the series expect, while other games just kind of exist. Dirt 5, ladies and gentlemen. I was pretty interested when I heard Codemasters' newest rally game was coming to Xbox Game Pass. Uh, well, <laughs> calling the Dirt series a rally game at this point is like calling Garfield Kart a sim racer, but hey, you bet I downloaded that shit the second it was available. And after finishing it, it seems I share the popular opinion of rev heads all over the globe collectively admitting a resounding... Yeah, it's... it's alright. For those uninitiated, Dirt originally started life as the continuation of the Colin McRae Rally series, which was the more standard time trial rally stuff, but as the Dirt rebrand began, it put less of a focus on actual rallying and more of a focus on actual racing, before briefly going back to rally territory, even though it didn't really need to because its spin-off series Dirt Rally was already filling that niche perfectly well, so no one really likes that one. Because they're uncultured children. Codemasters said, oh, I guess we made an oopsie. Then taped some neons, a purple smoke machine, and a copy of car seat headrests making a door less open to the cover and pegged it at people hoping they'd like it. Guess it didn't go too well, eh, Codies? So here we have Dirt 5, the latest in an ever-growing list of modern racing games to receive a mixed reception. I mean, the last few years have given us such divisive games as Need for Speed Heat, Project Cars 3, the ongoing support of Forza Horizon 4, Dangerous Driver- uh, no, actually, no, that one just straight up sucks, and hearing that the sequel is going open world sounds awful, what the fuck are those guys doing? And now we have Dirt 5. And I think the mixed reaction is deserved because half the time I'm enjoying myself and half the time I want to bash Codemasters over the head with a big stick. The name of the game here is Arcade Oriented Off-Road Racing against 11 opponents across a variety of locations across the globe. You'll get plopped into a race, asked to bump a car your way into first place, but that's okay sweetie, you don't have to get first place if you don't want to, we'll still let you progress, and rinse and repeat for about 95% of the game's career mode. There's a bunch of different event types, apparently? Like, there's Rally Raid, which is modern rally cars, Stampede, which is SUVs and trucks, usually with some sort of unruly weather condition, Land Rush, which is racing on sand or snow, Icebreaker, which is whatever class the game feels like throwing at you, but on ice, Ultra Cross, which is modern rally cars on mixed terrain, eh? I don't know why they went through so much trouble to give these events different names when they're all literally just races. It's the equivalent of that one scene from MasterChef where they're like, uh, today I've made a breaded chicken piccata with lemon jasmine rice. When the dude who's got a head like a baby's like, this is, this is, this, it, 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 it's, it's chicken nuggets. But what's important is that the racing itself is fun, and I can at least say that, yes, it's fun. In a turn your brain off and don't expect to be challenged kind of way. Cars themselves are pretty enjoyable to control, they're all too eager to get sideways and the track design accommodates for this very well, ranging from sweeping turns to successions of tight, windy hairpins that practically require you to punch that handbrake. The more, uh, I guess regular cars are really fun to zip about in, particularly the classic 80s and 90s rallies, modern rally and rallycross classes. And the cross raid and pre-runner classes are big heavy bastards that still manage to elegantly slide around most corners no issue while still feeling like you're driving an enraged dinosaur. Other car classes don't fare as well in my opinion. Once you get over the novelty of driving an Aston Martin or a Lotus XE off-road, the GT rally class is full of cars that are a little too eager to be sideways and it makes for very imprecise racing most of the time. Similar issues sometimes pop up with the trophy trucks and super lights, while Formula off-road cars never want to drift at all and end up feeling a little too stiff to be enjoyable. There's a really nice variety of cars here, and a lot of surprises I don't think I've seen pop up in any other game before. From a few of the buggies and super lights to some of the electric cars such as the Mitsubishi E Evolution and the Volkswagen ID buggy, but I do enjoy driving the more regular rally vehicles over the trophy trucks and buggies. At least they're not the sprint cars, good lord! Who the hell sat down at a meeting at the Codemasters HQ and said, You know, I don't think players like going straight, I think players want to be oversteering left all the time. Where do you live? I am going to grab you and smoosh your body into a mushy pile and reconstruct your DNA into that of a two-week-old banana. <clears throat> I retract my fuck because there's also the Pathfinder events, which are a hell of a lot of fun by comparison. In these events you'll drive over rugged terrain and through narrow gaps all in the name of reaching the finish line as fast as possible. But while you're in a time limit, going flat out pedal to the metal is never the best solution. I know it may be tempting to floor it up that incline and launch yourself into the stratosphere, but you'll think twice unless you want to end up like this gentleman. I had to censor it because it's poo. These events would maybe be the highlight of the game for me if only there wasn't a grand total of two layouts where these events 
events take place at. And these events repeat several times throughout the career, so by the time you get to the end of the career, you're just like, oh, it's this track again, let me just casually decimate the part-time while I scratch my cubicle fossus. That's a thing, I swear I'm not making it up, Google it. As enjoyable as those are, though, I have to de-retract my fuck, because Gymkhana is back from Dirt 3, and it's... Eh, not fun, I'm sorry, Tim Connor is really cool in real life, but here it's just doing donuts in the same purple square for a minute and a half. Also because of how twitchy some of the vehicles are, it's impossible to fit through the narrow gaps without taking a wheel off. Note, you cannot actually take a wheel off, which feels like something that should happen in current year considering V8 Supercars Race Driver 3 did it back in 2005, but you know, whatever. Despite how much some of the gameplay types and vehicle classes make me groan, I still think Dirt 5 is pretty fun when it comes down to it. The physics feel suitably loose and easy to grasp, and it's pretty easy easy for anyone to immediately pick up, let alone master after a few races. Sliding around bends in most cars is effortless, and it kind of makes you feel half decent at racing right off the bat, which is a pretty nice feeling. But the skill ceiling isn't too high either. You won't be spinning out of control too often like you're playing with all assists off on Project Cars or something. And honestly you probably won't have too much trouble with the AI either. I do think there's a lack of that sort of bounciness that other off-road games have. Tracks are designed pretty well overall, but even though there are plenty of jumps, they still largely feel quite flat in comparison to contemporaries such as Gravel. I am one of only six people that remembers Gravel exists, and probably one of four that actually likes it. <laughs> But yeah, let's back up a bit. Uh, that AI. I played through a good chunk of the game alternating between the two highest difficulties, and in particular the AI on the highest difficulty ranged from second place is 10 seconds behind, to remember that one issue Forza had where first place would take off and you'd never be able to catch up even if the soul of Peter Brock possessed you and took the wheel. Yeah, that. So there's a kind of annoying trade-off. Drop the difficulty down a notch and beat every race with ease, or turn it up and occasionally have absolutely no chance of winning. And sometimes you have no choice but to just restart because you'll get lost in a sea of opponents driving like they're afraid to go over 10 kilometers an hour at the start of the race, which gives those out in front a massive head start. This is very much a bumper car simulator, but when everything works, it's a fun bumper car simulator. Career progression is a mixed bag. If you finish a race, you'll unlock more races as you move along branching paths, but you'll need to earn stamps to be able to enter the main events at the end of each section, and you earn those by placing as high as possible. You can also earn a stamp by completing the three bonus objectives given to you, so you don't necessarily have to win. These objectives are totally random though, and not at all tailored to the event you're entering. Many are very generic challenges like overtaking opponents, doing a few drifts, really simple stuff that you'll be hard pressed not to do, but then you've got stuff like maintain 100 10 kilometers an hour for 15 seconds on a tiny little track with barely any straights where you take each corner at around 80 or perform 10 drifts in a Pathfinder event where there's not really any room or even any reason to do so or how about five overtakes in a one-on-one -on -one throwdown and then there's just the annoying ones like overtaking while drifting which is hard enough to do on its own but it eventually starts asking for multiple in one race let alone the fact that the game's definition of a drift is about as defined as the word bomber clut. If it's not random challenges that don't match the event at all, it's ridiculous things like hold first place for 100 seconds, which encourages you to push opponents out of the way and clamber to first as soon as possible instead of more naturally spending the race moving up the ranks. These challenges only pop up when you stay with a sponsor for a long time, and thankfully you can ignore them safely, it just means you'll miss out on some rewards, like paint jobs and stuff. But as it is, these objectives feel tacked on due to their random nature. Yeah, you can re-roll objectives by spending like a thousand bucks or something, but I think it would have been way better if challenges were tailor-made for each event, and to have three stamps for placing first and three stamps for beating objectives, earning the game a bit of replay value and giving players more ways to progress, instead of all three totally optional objectives only being worth one. One thing that definitely stands out though is the presentation. Oh man, when Dirt 5 tries, it is absolutely gorgeous. It looks pretty good when the conditions are your standard sunny skies, but it's the more extreme weather conditions that really shine here. In particular, thunderstorms are ferocious in their ability to completely light up the track, a brief split second respite from the darkness. Snowstorms are also common and those look equally spectacular and terrifying, especially so in the rare instance they appear during the middle of the night. This was legitimately tricky to navigate, even with the trackside lights trying their best to guide me, but it also only happened once or twice during the career, so it was a super memorable experience for me. And that visual splendor extends to the track selection as well. Whether it's a track with a view of Mount Everest poking its head through the clouds, a jaunt around Manhattan Park, speeding through a tunnel of bamboo thickets in China, or wading through dust storms in Morocco. The 10 countries in Dirt 5 are all hugely varied, and there's 70 layouts between them, so you definitely won't be feeling the sting of repetition too often. Most of them are honestly pretty memorable on top of that. Like, 
man, it's just a really decent little track selection. This was a game I played in occasionally short bursts whenever I was winding down for the night or had to babysit my siblings, so I ended up installing it on my laptop, an Asus ROG Strix with an RTX 2070 squeezed into its fat dump truck ass. Cranking everything up to Ultra had it fluctuating between 55 and 65 FPS, so for that smoother frame rate I lowered everything down to very high, where the visuals didn't even seem to take a hit, and yet I was getting a more consistent average of 80 FPS, barely falling any lower than that when the more intense weather effects kicked in. But yeah, visually, Dirt 5 can be gorgeous. Audio-wise, it can sometimes be a little bit of an assault of corny dialogue and so-so music choices. Out on the track, it's pretty impressive. Engine sounds are mostly really nice to listen to, impacts sound pretty crunchy, and the in-game music can be heard coming from somewhere within the stands so it fades in and out appropriately as you pass by, almost completely muffled if you enter either of the game's cockpit cameras. Sound, uh, it's not my forte, I'm really bad at describing it, but they they did good here, I think. Don't know if the engine sounds are accurate, but accuracy was never something I was really interested in. If it sounds good, I don't care, and I think Dirt 5 sounds good, so yeah. Then you get to the story stuff, and I use very big air quotes when using the word story. The lads from Donut Media host an in-game podcast that follows the rivalry between your mentor, AJ Styles, and both his and your ultimate rival, Bruno Durand, played respectively by Troy Baker and Nolan North. AJ talks a whole lot of shit, mostly uninteresting, sometimes utterly profound like he's some dickhead with a man bun who reads a little too much into his daily horoscope. And look, we, we won our way. We never once uh, forgot why we why we raced in the first place, and, and I, I feel... I feel a little inspired, to be honest. But it sounds like Nolan North had a fair bit of fun as Bruno Durant. He's this self-important guy who claims he's just in it for the racing and doesn't care about rivalries and whatnot. I mean, he's still ranked higher than you. He has more races under his belt in the series. Mm -hmm. So I guess you're just waiting for him to retire? Well, first of all, rankings are uh, a system set up by people who probably have never gotten behind the wheel of a car. Okay, I oh. feel personally attacked <laughs> by that statement. Uh, well... It's true. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, things that go into winning a race. Quite frankly, AJ and everybody else is in my rearview mirror. The boys from Donut Media are good boys, but they're obnoxiously unfunny here. I'm sitting here listening to a tutorial video for the next event type, and they're dropping jokes about random shit like, Next up is Land Rush. Rush sounds a bit like the thing I get between my legs every now and then. That's Thrush, James, and I'll thank you to keep that to yourself on the podcast. That's not actually something that's said, but that's what you should expect. Totally random non sequiturs that have absolutely nothing to do with what you're looking at. If I say Jim Gymkhana, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Donuts. Cars doing donuts. Uh, what's the second thing that comes to mind? Horses uh, not doing donuts. Some of it's pretty funny, and I guess it's kind of neat that they attempted to add a little bit of personality to the career mode with this podcast and AJ and Bruno's rivalry, but it's a little hard to get invested when it's all presented in an easily skippable audio format. The one other thing Dirt 5 has going for it though is its playground mode. This was what I was most interested in leading up to the game's launch. It's a mode filled with player created time trials, obstacle courses and gymkhana events with a browser that curates the best levels and creators. I was low key hoping for a proper track editor, but what we got instead is a really fun little tool to fool around with a few times for casual players, and something that has a lot of staying power for those who get hooked. There's plenty of props and track pieces for you to use, and from my limited time with the editor as well as the many densely populated tracks I've played, the memory and prop budgets are extremely lenient, so you'll have no issue building the multi-layered obstacle course shaped like a cock that you're no doubt cooking up in your perverted little brain right now. Really, I only have two issues with it. The space allocated to place props in, no matter which biome you choose, is tiny as all heck, so there's a bit of a focus on tighter courses with more verticality over tracks with high speed sections. Also, playing other people's creations tended to crash my game a lot, so it's not something I've been able to sink my fangs into, which is a shame because it's a good time, you know? Finish a track, get immediately wrecked recommended a bunch of similar tracks and just sit back and let the game blast user-made content in your face until you get bored. When it chooses to work, I find it more enjoyable than the main game. And that's the thing, the main game is not exactly bad, it's just underwhelming. It's an enjoyable enough game at its core, but for games like this, its career mode is what makes or breaks it in my eyes, and Dirt 5's is perhaps one of the most bland and uninteresting attempts at a career mode in a good while. 
Sponsorships could have been a fun diversion, but there's really nothing to them and staying with them to unlock the goodies they hide is frustrating more so than it is fun. You can buy new cars, but most of the cars in any one class handle more or less the same as each other. And you get a free car for each class anyway, meaning you never get locked out of an event for not having the right type of car. So the opportunity for an engaging car collecting experience is totally absent. There's no real escalation towards better cars either, you'll have sampled every vehicle type very early into the game. And also, each car only has a few different libraries each, and most of them are locked until past level 40 or so. I beat the final career event at level 49. Like I said at the start, sometimes I'm really enjoying myself, and in that moment I would eagerly recommend Dirt 5. But then my mood gets brought back down by mediocre progression and weird design choices that make me want to smack the devs with a big stick. Sometimes the game feels super varied, sometimes it's dull and repetitive. You'll probably have fun with it, and you'll probably forget all about it. And ain't that just the state of racing games these days, huh? Hey guys, thanks for watching. Uh, sorry for the shitty mic quality, but uh, this is definitely not the video I wanted to put out right now. Uh, I've been working on a couple different things that have all had their own issues, like I lost a bit of footage that I needed for the next rack log and a review for Jack and Daxter The Lost Frontier, but also the Need for Speed retrospective has hit a bit of a creative rough patch, so I've been sort of rethinking how I want to approach that series, so I've unfortunately had to push that back as well. So this video, uh, mm, I've had it sitting on my PC see half edited since June or July or something like that and I thought eh I'll just throw it out when there's a gap in my content that needs filling and uh here we are at said gap anyway whatever it's fine uh for November I want to push out the next rack log and get the Lost Frontier video done as it coincides with Jack Month a community driven event where everyone just makes Jack and Daxter content for what I believe is its uh 20th anniversary then in December, I want to tackle Forza Horizon 5, do a little end of year wrap up where I talk about games and events that interested me in 2021. Then when the new year starts, I want to dive headfirst into Spyro A Hero's Tale. Uh, I've been working on a video for Fuel. Remember Fuel? No, I don't blame you. Uh, the third rack log is already being scripted. The big Ratchet and Clank video I keep teasing is finally happening for real real and not for cray cray. And um, yeah. There's also so many other projects I'm working on that I don't want to announce just yet, but I really can't wait to share with everyone. Obviously, I'm only one person, so sometimes production can be a little slow, but I'm going to make a conscious effort to get things really going next year. So thank you to everybody who continues to stick around, and uh, hopefully very soon I'll have some stuff that you guys will really like. Anyway, um, no Q&A this time because I'm a bit muddled, but uh, thanks to everyone who continues to support me over on Patreon. Including Sofox, K, Damian Maxted, Dalek Boy, Furball, Nation McAltile, Aetheric Ruby, Alice Whitaker Bartlett, Heat Hood Skyet, Jackie Pendragon, Jayette, Johannes Anderson, Eric, Matt Beaker, Juzzy Become Android, Kuroto the Kitsune, Leo Alex50, Native Light, Pear Basket, Philip Elk, Raindra, Sheepy, Sinister Putty Tat, Squid Superstar, The Dervinator, and Travis Miranda. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you all next time.